So uh, our first presenter is Megan Stout Sybil, and uh, she is a historian and a curator at the Salisbury House. And she will tell the story of the family behind the Salisbury House, its creation, and its legacy. Please welcome Megan. One, it's great to have such an amazing crowd out here at Salisbury House tonight. Before I get started, I just wanted to welcome everyone here on behalf of the, the staff at Salisbury House. Thank PKN for letting us host this amazing event. And if you're not familiar with us or what we do, we've got quite a few flyers floating around. We've got some great programming coming up in October and November, so please do take a look at that. SalisburyHouse.org is also a great place to go to find out more details. So tonight, I'm going to start us off with the story of Salisbury House, give you a sense of who built Salisbury House, when and why, um, and really kind of try to walk us through the story of this amazing structure. So what you're looking at now is Salisbury House around 1928. Um, ground is broken here on Tonawanda Drive in 1923, and we have this little guy here to thank for it. This is Carl Weeks. Um, he's born in 1876 in Lynn County, Iowa, so he's an Iowa boy. I think we, we can all be glad that little boy's hairstyles and clothing styles have changed <laughs> since the 1870s, um, but he is the man who has eventually the inspiration for what becomes Salisbury House. He makes his money through cosmetics. He has a pharmaceutical background. Um, around 1900, he's a young man. He's living in Centerville, Iowa. And this is his pharmacy that he had there. Um, and he's in Centerville for a few years. Eventually, though, he comes back to Des Moines and starts um, doing pharmaceuticals and cosmetics with his brothers. It's also in Des Moines in the early 20th century, in 1907, that he marries his wife, Edith Van Slyke. Carl marries up. Edith is um, comes from a sort of higher class background than Carl, um, and they court and marry in 1907. Very soon thereafter, start to have a family. Um, they go on to have four boys. Uh, this is Edith with their first three sons around 1913, 1914. They eventually have four. Um, the last son isn't born until 1918. Um, but this is the family mid-19-teens. It's also at this same period of time that Carl incorporates Armand Cosmetics, and this is what becomes literally his million-dollar idea. So between around 1915 and around 1920, 22, he literally makes millions of dollars. And the Armand Cosmetics Company, this is an ad from Vogue from around 1922, becomes among the top-selling cosmetics in the country. It's wildly successful. And it's with those funds that the family, pictured here in 1921, starts to think about moving to a new home. Uh, Carl liked to tell the story that Edith threatened to divorce him if they didn't either move to a bigger house or build a bigger house. You can imagine with four growing boys um, that perhaps her complaint was well justified. Um, this is where they originally lived, <laughs> here in Des Moines. Uh, this is at 47... Um, 39th, rather, and Forest, so very near Drake, just a little bungalow. It's actually still there. So, you know, Edith, in complaining to Carl, certainly was justified, I think, in doing so. So it's in the early 20s. They're still living here. Carl and Edith travel to England, and it's here on a visit to Salisbury, England, that they see this very structure. It's called the King's House, this old English manor house that's built over centuries, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, that provides the inspiration for this house here in Des Moines. So they visit England in the early 20s, see the King's House, and in 1923 break ground here on top of the hill off Tonawanda Drive. So this is Salisbury House being built. This picture is taken around 1925. Um, you can see if you came in from the south, this is the south entrance. Uh, the room that we're in now is barely constructed at this point, and it's a project that takes about five years to complete. When it is completed in 1928, again a view from the south looking north you can see what an impressive structure it is. If you got here after dark tonight, it's worth coming back in the daytime to get a good look. So here today, right, we're in, in what we think of as a historic house museum, but of course it started life as a family's residence. These four boys are running around and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> when you enter tonight through the Great Hall, this is where Carl and Edith would have greeted their guests when the family lived here. Um, and this is where we see things that we typically talk about on our tours. The ceiling, the balcony, the fireplace. These are all actually salvaged pieces from 16th century English structures. Carl and Edith are salvaging before HGTV starts doing it in the 21st century. <laughs> 
This is the library. Again, come back, take a guided tour. You'll be able to see that then. Um, Carl loved collecting books, and his books in Rare Documents collection, which we still have the bulk of, is incredible. Um, we have some really amazing pieces. Um, one of my favorites is what you're looking at now. This is one of our three Abraham Lincoln documents. This is a friend of a friend, essentially, writing to Lincoln, asking for his autograph. June 28, 1860. Lincoln's not even president yet at this point. He's just the Republican nominee. But it's a great piece and really illustrates um, how how incredible of, of a collection we have. Another one of my favorites, one of our several first edition Ernest Hemingways, Green Hills of Africa from 1935, uh, is actually inscribed by Hemingway to Carl, to Carl Weeks, instead of a drink at Pena's with very best wishes. <laughs> Pena's was actually Hemingway's favorite bar in Key West. Um, we're not sure the connection there between Weeks and Hemingway, but there is one. So by the mid-50s, Carl and Edith and their family's time here at Salisbury House was coming to an end. 54-55, the Teachers Union, the Iowa State Education Association, purchases Salisbury House, the grounds, the collections, and has their headquarters here from the mid-50s through uh, the late 1990s. This is one of the last images we have of Carl and Edith, um, taken early to mid-50s. Edith had been ill later in life. She passes away in 1955. Carl follows in 1962 but they of course left this amazing legacy for us today. So the ISEA has their offices here. Most of the structure is made in, into office space, but the Great Hall, this photo is, is from the Great Hall, and the common room were left open for school tours. So this is a school tour group, um, you know, in late 50s, early 60s, taken looking down from the balcony, but it's just a really kind of interesting photo. I love the, the clothes that the kids are wearing. The Great Hall looks really interesting. <laughs> I know, Redford, right? So of course, Redford, you gotta love the V-neck. I'm sure he's got a gold chain in there. Um, and this gentleman, you may recognize on the bottom, this is a young Tom Harkin. Um, Redford was here campaigning for Harkin and we think his 1980-something congressional um, run. So Salisbury House today, looking again from the south to the north, we have all kinds of amazing um, uh, things to see here, things to experience, our programs, our events. We have you know, all kinds of ways in which we really try to focus on preserving, interpreting, and sharing Carl and Edith's legacy, which is what our, our mandate is. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Woo!